Hello, I'm Alan LeBlanc, president of Brew to Serve Restaurant Group, and I would like to welcome you to the 2020 Atlanta Journal-Constitution Decatur Book Festival, presented by Emory University. I am speaking to you from our bookstore at Bullmunk Brewing Company. We are proud to sponsor tonight's session, and I am honored to be introducing distinguished poet and author Kevin Young. In addition to the culinary arts, Brew to Serve believes that the literary arts enrich in our community, and we are committed to building community through events such as our Prize in Southern Poetry, held annually by our restaurant, White Oak Kitchen and Cocktails. In fact, Kevin was the judge for our inaugural year five years ago. Our newest concept, Bold Monk Brewing Company in West Midtown, builds on this cultural commitment through events such as our collaboration with the Decatur Book Festival in a Distinguished Author series. So tonight's conversation is of special interest to us. Kevin Young is the director of, Re of Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, in addition to being the editor of the New Yorker magazine in poetry. His work has been recognized with numerous awards in his brand new work, an anthology titled African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song will be our topic for the evening. And now I give you Kevin Young, along with our moderator, Tony Powers. Have a great evening. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the 2000 Atlanta Journal-Constitution Decatur Book Festival presented by Emory University. My name is Tony Powers. I'll be your host this evening. I'm the mayor pro tem in the city of Decatur. The city welcomes you to its first and first ever virtual book festival. We're grateful tonight for our sponsors, White Oak Kitchen and Bold Monk Brewing. Tonight's event will feature someone that I like to call a friend. Uh, Kevin Young. Kevin Young and his book of poetry, The American, The African American Poetry, 250 Years of Song and Struggle. We're going to have a good time tonight as Kevin and I dig deep into what this collection means to him and what it means to this nation. But a little first, a little first, a little bit about Kevin. From 2005 to 2016, Kevin was a curator of the Raymond Donowski Poetry Library at Emory University. He was named Distinguished Professor at Emory University. He was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2016. He's a Stegner Fellowship, has a Stegner Fellowship in Poetry from Stanford University, a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, a McDowell Colony Fellowship, and an honorary doctorate from Beloit College. He currently serves as the director of the Schomburg Center for, for Research in Black Culture. His list of accolades are long, as well as his extensive collection of literary works, including Blue Laws, The Book of Hours, The Gray Album, Dear Darkness, for the Confederate Dead, Black Maria, To Repel Ghosts, The Remix, and To Repel Ghosts, The Double Album. <laughs> he is quite an accomplished writer and poet. I am so happy tonight to bring this conversation to you, those out there in virtual world. Kevin, welcome, my friend. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. So, I mean, looking at, you know, I've known you about 10 years, looking at this list of accomplishments, man, it, 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 it. so the first question I got to ask you is, how did you get involved writing poetry? What bit you? Yeah. What inspired you? I mean, for me, poetry was, uh, 
a way of saying what I couldn't always say, uh, I think. And I discovered it really, uh, I was in Kansas, which is where I went to high school and, and middle school uh, and part of grade school. So moving there when I was 10, um, I had moved a lot. Uh, my family's from Louisiana. And so um, that combination of having this rooted place, Louisiana, uh, and we, in my father's side, I've been in the same patch of land for 200 years. Um, and then on my mother's side, she's been there a long, long time too. So long that there's two graveyards in these two places that are filled with my uh, kinfolk, you know. And, um, but we moved around a lot. So in a way it was like a combination of being rooted and being displaced, which in a weird way, when I started writing seriously and wrote the poems that became my first book, I started thinking was kind of exemplary of the African-American uh, tradition. You know, we are as culturally and as a people, I think, very much rooted in this place. Um, but there's also this displacement. There's the great migration, of course. And then there's other kinds of uh, being made not to belong, let's say. And I, what I love about this anthology is it kind of captures those uh, tensions, I think, in the tradition. Um, as I, the subtitle says, it's African-American poetry, 250 years of struggle and song. And that struggle and the song, I think, you know, when I started, they might have seemed kind of separate. Now they seem like they're interrelated, you know, and we sing about struggles, <coughs> excuse me, and we struggle to sing, you know, we, we, we make things happen, uh, as my family would say, make no way out of no way. And, and um, you know, for me as a writer, that was the moment when I think I went from being just someone who wrote poems and tried to get them down on the page to understanding the tradition I found myself in, uh, which is captured in this book, which is a rich tradition. And as I trace here, it goes back 250 years. So you wrote your first book while you were still an undergraduate at Harvard University. This is true. You studied under Seamus Haney, who some consider the greatest Irish poet. Tell me what that was like. Uh, well, Seamus is a great person and a great poet. Um, you know, I, I think he's one of our greats, period, you know. Um, and it was amazing to study with him. I studied with other great teachers there, but Seamus was really good at um, helping you understand what the life of a poet would be like or could be like. And obviously he had an extraordinary uh, version of that, but he also made it seem like that was possible. You know, I, his growing up uh, in part in the country uh, helped me think about, I could write about some of those things and some of those places, which I, I don't think I would have, fully embraced, though there were other Black poets who certainly did, people like Lucille Clifton and uh, e even someone like Nikki Giovanni who writes so wonderfully about being from the South and, uh, so, and poems about Knoxville and other things. But, you know, he gave this sort of concrete in-person example of, you know, uh, how you could just be in the world. And he would tell us stories like, well, I, when I was reading with Auden, you know, <laughs> and you'd be like, oh, wow, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so he felt both connected to this past and he also made it sort of casual and part of it. And then coming to Emory uh, in 2005, like I did, you know, after a couple of years, I became the head of the uh, literary collections as well as the Donowski Poetry Library. And, you know, part of the literary collections were Heaney's letters, you know, and, and to be there with that, it felt full circle. And, you know, when he died, I uh, had just seen him because I brought him to campus for the Donowski Poetry Reading Series. And I remember literally hugging him in the snow and saying, you know, what we had the best dinner. I mean, it was just a spectacular dinner. The food was great. Um, and just the company, which is, of course, what makes any meal. And just hugging him in the snow, which is, of course, unusual in Atlanta, uh, and saying bye to him, it seemed, you know, uh, something that I'll never forget. And um, to have that opportunity to come full circle was really important for me. But he was uh, exemplary, too, as a literary citizen. And I, I think some of my uh, wish to do that and show up, you know, is, is comes from him because he I remember I've told this story before that he um, gave a reading um, and uh, 
there's a wonderful poet named William Corbett who's no longer with us either, but, uh, and I brought him, Bill Corbett and others for uh, a celebratory reading of Seamus. And I told this story, which is that I went to see Seamus read. And then, you know, usually when, if you give a reading and certainly if you're Seamus, he need to have an event for you. So I assume he was off at his event and I went to a bookstore uh, Harvard bookstore, so happens. And lo I looked up ahead and there was Seamus Heaney. Uh, and he was going into the bookstore, but not <laughs> just to get a book, but to go to another reading. So he went to another reading after his reading, which just was incredible. And then Bill Corbett stood up and said, well, it was my reading. And we had agreed that he, because you know, he knew uh, Seamus, don't come to my reading. Okay, we won't go to each other's readings. And then Seamus uh, showed up. Um, and so I have a wonderful picture from that night. And it just was important for me to, uh, as a generative force and, you know, Irish poetry and African-American poetry have a lot in common and speak to each other. And Seamus, uh, with his famous poem, uh, Strange Fruit, kind of captures this connection. And, um, you know, we, uh, that connection, I think, was really important for me as I was writing and then also as I, I was a curator at Emory. So, um, you know, a lot of people may not know this about you, but I'm going to claim you as an honorary dog. You <laughs> taught at my alma mater, the University okay. of Georgia, the, oh, it's along the, with yeah. another famous poet who yeah. is a good friend of both of ours. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's amazing how, you know, you've traveled down this path and we were destined to, to, to meet. I mean, it, yeah, it just absolutely. it just seemed destined to happen that way. Absolutely. So I want to talk a little bit about one of your books of poetry and uh, I know this one's special to you I mean I read it and I cried when I read it uh, the book of hours yeah and uh, you know you and I were speaking before we came on and you know talking about your son Mac one of your pieces in that book actually the book is about you know both grief uh, you know the loss of your father and the birth of your son but the poem that hit me the hardest was called charity Oh, yeah, I can read you that if you want. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, that book is a book that I think of working on in Atlanta and in Decatur, you know. Uh, it was very much a book of memory, uh, thinking about my father and returning to sort of the days after he died, the hours, if you will, and, um, you know, the phrase book of hours it was only till i think i was reading on the radio once that i realized it wasn't just book of hours which is like a small worship book you might carry um uh that was also o-u-r-s and like our okay. book you know and and that mm -hmm. was really important to me um and you know i really wanted to capture because i feel like people always talk about what it means to lose someone and in the States, I feel like we're especially bad at talking about it um, and, and thinking about it. And um, so let me see if I can find this poem in this, um, in Blue Laws. So, and this is a poem about, um, uh, you know, all the things that happen after someone dies, including like, what do you do with their things? Um, and so it's called Charity. Charity. So many socks. After the pair, the undertaker asks for, I picture them black beneath the fold in your open casket, your toes still cold. What else to do? Body bags of old suits, shirts still pressed, long johns, the unworn, unwashed wreckage of your closet, too many coats to keep, though I will save so many. How can I give away the last of your scent? And still, Father, you have errands, errant dry cleaning to pick up. Yellow tags whose ghostly carbon tells a story where to look. One place closed for good, the tag old. One place with none of your clothes just stares as if no one ever dies, as if you are naked somewhere, and I suppose you are. Nothing here. The last place knows exactly what I mean, brings me shirts hanging like a head, starched collars your beard had worn. One man saying sorry, older lady in the back saying how funny you were, how you joked with her weakly. Sorry, 
and a fellow black man hands your clothes back for free, don't worry. I've learned death has few kindnesses left. Such is charity, so rare and so rarely free that on the way back to your emptying house, I weep. Then drive everything, swaying, straight to goodwill, open late to live on another body and day. You know, that uh, when you read those things at, you know, two in the morning, three in the morning, you know, you think about, you know, I think about my own father's loss and we weren't that close. However, you know, it, it, it hits you and all those feelings come back and that really, it makes it personal. But then I go on to think you lost your father, but you gained a son mm. who is, you know, I still can't believe he's 14. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. I just chuckle. Like, I remember him being the little kid. That yeah, you're like, is, is he uh, fifth grade? Or, you know, like, no. <laughs> right. He's a teenager now. So, yeah, so, I mean, part of that book was really writing about him and uh, what it meant to have him come into our lives, you know. Well, he's a, he's a wonderful young man. So let's talk about your new work. Yeah. What, I, how much time and how much research did you do to compile what might be the greatest work of African-American poetry ever assembled in a book? Well, I, I like the idea of that. I, um, <laughs> you know, I really set out to just try to capture that tradition. And like I said before, it's a really rich tradition. And uh, it took about six years, I'd say. Um, and some days it felt like a thousand years. Some days it felt like, you know, just last week. And one of the great things, I think, uh, was discovering how many poets who wrote long ago feel really contemporary. Uh, you know, someone like Claude McKay, the Jamaican-born poet who came to the States. He came to Kansas, actually, uh, after and went to Case, what's now K-State um, for a time uh, when he first came to the States. But, you know, he writes these wonderful sonnets about America and lynching and, you know, If We Must Die, his famous sonnet about resistance. And I thought about that a lot uh, this summer. Here we are in a summer of discontent, much like Red Summer when he was writing. Um, and, you know, I was finishing the book early this summer. And I think the introduction uh, I finished on Juneteenth, you know, and so it felt like all these forces and what I was uh, amazed by is looking back at that history, the long arc of the book and seeing, you know, it's over a thousand pages. And I really don't think many anthologies will be able to contain this tradition. I mean, I, I um, wish it could be a thousand more because there were so many great uh, poems uh, to include. But I really realized that there were people were already telling this story of protest. You know, I, I think that as soon as uh, Black poets took pen to paper, protest was there, especially because we were uh, not allowed to read or write, you know? And so you be it becomes a kind of protest, the very act of composing. Uh, and we've had this long history of, of that struggle through song. Um, and, you know, the poems, I think, strike me so much in terms of their uh, urgency their critique, uh, both of poetry and of power. And they think a lot about uh, musicality and pleasure and, you know, a, a lot of things, you know, they write about everything, which is, you know, to say they're uh, deeply uh, engaged with life in all ways. But I also think there's something special in particular about this tradition that we also have to name and that I think comes across in the book. You know, it's funny, you mentioned you finished on Juneteenth. It's appropriate, and I think your home, your uh, former hometown would have done you proud. On Juneteenth, as we struck that hour, uh, there was a Confederate obelisk that was located downtown in the city of Decatur right. on the square. Yeah. And at Juneteenth, it came down. <laughs> and so how appropriate for you to finish, you know, what considerably is, you know, one of the greatest collections of our people's history on that day. Sure. Uh, you know, at, as you compiled this, I'm sure that you spent time, you know, was there anything that sort of snuck up and said, wow, I never knew that this person had done 
was there that kind of moment during the six years of research? Yeah. I mean, I spent a lot of time in the archives uh, that, you know, perhaps not a surprise since I was a curator for so long and now run an archive and, uh, you know, cultural center in the Schomburg Center. But I was really uh, struck by doing that kind of research about learning about people, uh, certainly people I didn't know. And I was really uh, determined to have the book be as close to 50 percent uh uh, people who weren't male, um, you know, women and uh, non-binary folk um, as possible. And, um, you know, we got really close. And there are some decades where there aren't many people publishing uh, as you wish, you know. And um, I think that was really what was interesting is to see those kind of waves of publishing. Uh, the Harlem Renaissance certainly is an explosion. I think people will be really pleased to see the range of writers there. Uh, a lot of women writers obviously were writing through the Harlem Renaissance, but the folks who published books often were men. And so how do you capture that full range of what was really being published at the time? And it was really important to go back to the magazines and to the, the uh, anthologies of the time, which really were diverse and filled with terrific writers like Jesse Fawcett and, uh, you know, um, one of my favorites is a woman named Mae Cowdery, um, who's really fascinating and, and died very young, but corresponded with Langston Hughes and uh, was a interesting figure. Uh, and, you know, I want to really represent people's breadth and the breadth of the tradition. That was so important. Uh, LGBTQ folk, you know, we really had to expand our notion of what we might see. And it wasn't, uh, it was part of the process. It was just part of the discovery and, and, you know, looking at the whole tradition and not, narrowing in or, or selecting, but trying to really show uh, that we've always been diverse. We've always had lots of groups of deep people writing. Um, there's also this wonderful group of writers writing in French. Uh, the first anthology of African-American poetry was in French in the 1830s, you know, and, and so to include those poets as part of the African-American tradition uh, was really important to me. Um, not just because my family's from Louisiana, where these people are, but because they they really thought about and and like so Hughes translated them, they had an impact on the tradition, and that was really some of the deciding factors too. Is how many people were naming and name checking uh, some of these older writers. That was really important, um, and it proceeds chronologically, but then within each sort of generation, um, it's alphabetical. So you can really discover and look around and see who's doing what, when. You know, it's, uh, you know, I started, you know, I'd get a little burst. I'd read, you know, two or three. I'd read, you know, two or three more. You know, when I first, uh, uh, when we were first given the assignment of, you know, picking a poet, of course, the first person I leaned to was Natasha because, you know, you she and I have known each other for years. But, you know, what I, I come to realize is there was a time in this city of Decatur where you, Natasha, and Jericho were all at Emory University. Sure. And, you know, I think about the three of you and what y'all have been able to do and bring to the table. You know, I feel humbled to know each and every one of you that this is something special. You know, I don't know if Emory will ever have the likes of three of you at the same time. You know, I hate that you, two of you have flown the coop and gone on to other things and I miss y'all dearly. But, you know, let's talk a little bit about maybe some of the things that you found during your research that was sort of an aha. Like, yeah, this is something that, you know, I could put on a tagline at the end of my email. Was there one of those sort of poems or yeah, songs I mean, that some of them I mentioned I mean I think some of the discoveries I think that people will find themselves are some of the younger writers you know uh, I think I discovered too that you know we weren't we were the young generation uh, for a long time and now there's a whole generation uh, younger than us and which is really wonderful to see and some of them are so terrific and writing just killer poems uh, and so uh, I hope that there's a level of discovery there. And, you know, it's almost an embarrassment of riches by poetry right now. And I think there's enough that everyone can find their own, you know, poet. Um, 
And some of the poets you named, I think, are writing some of the best poems in the tradition. And Jericho's book, of course, is called The Tradition. And in it, I think, is, is a kind of culmination of some of these ideas. Um, but I, of course, I was doing this for six years. So, um, you know, it was, it's been wonderful to see. I had to go back and change my introduction to say, like, all these people have won the Pulitzer because uh, and really until Natasha, um, there weren't as many. There were, you know, I think Natasha is the fourth black person to win in poetry. And then since then, there's been uh, four more, I think. I could be getting my number wrong off the yeah. top of my head, but I had to change it, um, which was a wonderful thing to have to change. I mean, that's, that's I think, one of the um, tests of the poetry. It's not the only test because, of course, there's many, many, you know, Langston Hughes never won a Pulitzer. Um, uh, and, you know, The New Yorker, where I'm the poetry editor, we didn't publish enough Langston Hughes poems back in the day. But I think now we can all sit back and look at, you know, this tradition and see it in a different way and see how rich it is and see how someone like Langston Hughes was grappling with huge issues that right now feel really urgent. And I think that's the thing that I would say is there's a real urgency to these poets uh, and even poets writing 150 years ago. You know, we look at them and say, oh, you know, they're talking about injustice and cruelty and compassion and desire and change and all these things that we now see in the street and we see on our TV, we see on our devices. And I think they're really relevant uh, is the thing I would, I would say is the biggest, it's not a surprise, but it's a biggest pleasure I think that people will discover. Yeah, you know, we, you, you speak of you know, where we are. This is an unprecedented time in our nation's history. Uh, we have a pandemic. We have a racial reckoning. I mean, we have so many issues that are coming to bear that, you know, hopefully this will provide some solace to those folks out here watching today and those that are going to buy the book, which is going to be available in the next couple of weeks. Uh, you can uh, get this book. I mean, it is an incredible piece of literature. Um, let's see, where was I going with that? Well, of course, we want you to pick a couple of selections and read them. And sure. I'm gonna put you on the spot and ask you to do maybe a couple and just give people a taste of what's in here. Sure. Yeah, I think I'm gonna try and read uh, um, Claude McKay. He has so many great poems and what I love about Claude McKay writing in the uh, teens and twenties is that he's able to capture some of what we were talking about. And this poem is simply called America. And he wrote these great sonnets. Uh, I think of them sometimes as militant sonnets or political sonnets. And the sonnet form he manages, which is of course means little song, he manages to imbue with struggle. So this is called America. Although she feeds me bread of bitterness and sinks into my throat her tiger's tooth, stealing my breath of life, I will confess I love this cultured hell that tests my youth. Her vigor flows like tides into my blood, giving me strength erect against her hate. Her bigness sweeps my being like a flood. Yet as a rebel fronts a king in state, I stand within her walls with not a shred of terror, malice, not a word of jeer. Darkly I gaze into the days ahead and see her might and granite wonders there beneath the touch of times an erring hand, like priceless treasures sinking in the sand. So that's a little Claude McKay. All right. Tiger All right. too, I mean, you know, he's, he's in there, you know? And I, I think that there's some of that sentiment still with us and tr trying to be understood. What else you wanna hear? Oh, let's, uh... dealer's choice. I'm going to ask you to pick one that really moved you. Okay. Should I um, do a Natasha poem? Let's see if I can find one. Speaking, you know, while you're talking about that, I'm going to throw this out there for, uh, for our audience uh, viewers today. Uh, I'm sure you have questions. If you're on crowdsource, at the bottom of the panel, there is a button that says, ask a question. If you'll fill out your question there, it will be populated and sent to me where I can ask Kevin your question online. So I'll read this poem night, Natasha, which is also a sonnet. It seems like a sonnet night. 
So it's called Graveyard Blues, uh, and it's from her tremendous book, Native Guard. And it's both a blues and a sonnet. Graveyard Blues. It rained the whole time we were laying her down. Rain from church to grave when we put her down. The suck of mud at our feet was a hollow sound. When the preacher called out, I held up my hand. When he called for a witness, I raised my hand. Death stops the body's work. The soul's a journeyman. The sun came out when I turned to walk away, glared down on me as I turned and walked away, my back to my mother, leaving her where she lay. The road going home was pocked with holes, that home-going road's always full of holes. Though we slow down, time's wheel still rolls. I wander now among names of the dead, my mother's name, stone pillar for my head. You know, what a great, you know, and I don't know if I can do this or not. Uh, I was going to share a picture uh, it was taken oh. about six years ago, and we were at Leon's, and uh, it was after one of our famous 3MLs, and I think in that picture, it was uh, Natasha, you and me, and I think we were raising a glass, and we might have been raising a glass for a friend of ours that we had lost, uh, Jake yeah. Adam York. Uh you know, who actually came up with our iconic 3ML <laughs> glass. All the, all the uh, business, all the... All you the know, it's... Uh, I like it. it, it, it it's, it's truly wonderful to, you know, think about some of those conversations around, you know, breaking bread and, you know, sure. everyone getting to know each other better. And uh, you know, I hope people are getting the sense that, you know, you are who you are and you care deeply about the work that you do and the poetry that you write. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it warms the soul to think that, you know, these are people our age that are doing things that we've imagined, you know, that we've read about that, you sure. know, here's an ordinary guy who has this, this, this resume, you know, <laughs> The only thing that's missing is that 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 Pulitzer behind your name. And do you think about something like that? <laughs> oh no, I mean, I, I think um, it's been really heartening to see Natasha and Jericho among all the other folks doing well. And you know, I I think what you're describing, I think, is a community that um, you know, when you're in it, it feels like it can go on forever. Uh, and sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But more importantly, later you look back and say, oh, well, that was a special moment and, you know, a special place and time. And I think Decatur always has that, you know, and we're especially missing that now that we can't all commune and c communicate together and, and, as they say, conversate and, you know, hang out. Um, we miss that, I think, collectively as uh, folks, Americans, you know, and so you know, I have a lot of hope that poetry can bridge some of that gap. Um, you know, I've been on too many uh, Zoom memorials. I was counting, I think I've been on six, you wow. know, and, and I've been thinking about how that has transformed us, you know, and now they're almost like, I'm, we're all, it's a form we're almost used to. And mm -hmm. that's both, you know, there's something heartening about it, but there's something chilling. And I, I don't know, I, for me, uh, poetry speaks to that deep part of us that is connected to each other and, and it can cross so many uh, lines of time and space. You know, you can read someone who's no longer with us and they like Claude McKay and they speak to us. And I wanna read one more poem from the anthology if that's okay by Lucy. Yes, Clifton. Lucy Clifton, Her papers are at Emory and um, she was a mentor to me. She picked my first book. I wouldn't be a writer certainly in the same way without her, either as her example, her literally picking mm -hmm. my poems. And then, uh, you know, I helped get her papers. I packed them up, you know, uh, years later. Um, and this poem, uh, sometimes I read a different one, but I want to read this one, which is called Study the Masters, uh, which is uh, about her aunt. Study the Masters, like my aunt Timmy. It was her iron or one like hers that smoothed the sheets 
the master poet slept on, home or hotel. What matters is he lay himself down on her handiwork and dreamed. She dreamed too, words, some Cherokee, some Maasai, and some huge and particular as hope. If you had heard her chanting as she ironed, you would understand form and line and discipline and order and America. Wow. Yes, I sir. Know. I know, yes, right? Sir. <laughs> I mean, that Miss Lucy, you know, people don't understand, you know, some of these things, they cut right to the things that we've all felt. I mean, yes, this sir. this reckoning, I mean, this is stuff that we have bled for our country. We have sure. built you know, we came here as the labor for this country, you know, and now, you know, we're just not, it's not about making things just go away. We need to tell the story of, you know, how and why, and, you know, it, it you can't just sweep it away and say, oh, that was a time in the past, right? You know, we no. reconcile all this. What she's saying, right, is that you have to understand this to understand America, to understand poetry. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think there's something beautiful about that. She makes in this poem, Aunt Timmy a master, um, but also is playing with that term. You know, it's, she's such a brilliant wordsmith uh, and we're all indebted to her and her work. You know, I'm, uh, I'm thinking we probably are gonna get ready for some questions. I'm not yeah, sure that the audience is ready. Uh, we're curious yeah. about. I wonder what people are curious about because, you know, I know that I could go on and I could do this all night and you and I could just go. I know. Um, you know, but I also want to remind people that uh, if you love the content that you're seeing today, please don't hesitate to donate to the Decatur Book Festival. We need your support. You know, something that started out, I remembered years ago when, you know, folks were sitting around and they were pitching this idea of a book festival and everybody thought Decatur book festival, you know, like we didn't read, like, you know, none of that happened. And now, I mean, yeah. it's just this amazing event. Well, and, and they've done a great job of, of moving virtual, which isn't easy, you know? Um, so I'm so happy to be back in this way. So we got about five more minutes of uh, conversation and then we'll queue oh, up the Q&A. Can we questions and conversate some more? Uh, it's up to you. You know, I think that, uh, you know, I need to pass you your glass because, <laughs> you know, I don't feel right, you know, <laughs> having this glass and you're not on the other I, end. I feel okay. I feel all right. Well, I mean. Hey, let's talk a little bit about the blues. Sure. Let's do it. You know, I know you that, uh, you know, <laughs> I've got them. You've got house a couple of times them. where we've had some pig on the grill and, you know, yeah. we've had some blues in the background. Sure. Tell me a little bit about the blues. How did that influence a lot of your writing? Yeah. I mean, for me, the blues uh, were always there, uh, but I became sort of conscious of wanting to, to write in that form or at least in that uh, matrix of meaning. Uh, really for my third book, you mm -hmm. know, so I had written a book about Jean-Michel Basquiat and that was really thinking about jazz in some way and, and, you know, process and how do you capture this life cut short? Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately many jazz musicians joined Jean-Michel Basquiat or, or led the way, whether it's Charlie Parker or Billie Holiday dying too young. And so okay. in the blues, I really found both the way to express uh, that mix of what Langston Hughes called laughing to keep from crying um, and then the, the sort of humor of the blues. And eventually I, I wrote a book called Jelly Roll of Blues, mm -hmm. excuse me, which thinks about these things quite uh, in terms of love poems and how do you write about loss, um, but also not just like, woe is me, but sort of like, woe is me laughing or, you know, boy, I'm so blue, but, you know, my, I, my head's so hard, I, you know, you know <laughs> that uh, I'm going to keep at it, you know, and I lived in Georgia at the time and I was um, at UGA and lived out sort of a little bit out of town and across these train tracks and the train was like, you know, I had just moved there. The train was one of my friends. So it ended mm -hmm. up with a lot of poems. And if you can't, if you end up with a lot of trains in your poems, you end up with a lot of blues. And I also think that it was a way of, of talking about pain 
but also transcending it. And the blues, I think, have perfected a kind of resistance, uh, but not the kind that we sometimes think of, which is denial, but instead, like, I'm going to admit or even, you know, make hyperbolic things that are as bad as you feared, but they're even worse. Uh, been down so long, it looks like up to me. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, you, you turn around and you, you might dance about it. You might make it into music. And, um, you know, I think after I wrote that book, I thought, well, I'm done with it for a while. You know, I don't need to mm -hmm. have the blues or use the blues. And then, you know, the blues come for you. Um, and then after I lost my dad and, and had a number of losses, it was a really a way to find a form to uh, speak of that. And that's what I think um, Natasha's doing, what Lucille Clifton's doing, what Claude McKay's doing. You need to find a form to be able to uh, deal with these feelings. And what the blues does is the form of the blues, it fights the feeling of the blues. And gotcha. that, you know, sometimes people think the blues is sad, but it's good time music, you know, and, yeah. and that kind of, you see it in things like hip hop where the music makes you dance, but they might be singing about something, some injustice, you know, rapping about it. And so mm -hmm. there's a real, uh, that tension that I think that's between struggle and song I find in the blues and in poetry too. Well, we got about two minutes. You want to pop one out from Jelly Roll? Oh, sure. I, I, I can. If you have it with you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to decide if you want a train or not. It, it, it's the classic city. Come on now. We got to have a train. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that's pretty funny. Uh, hold on one second. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, well, this one is a train. Um, so this is called Threnody. Uh, so it's more the sad side than the funny side, though there's some funny in there. All right. It's called Threnody. Even cars had their graveyards piled and turning the one color of after. And me, with nowhere to send my bones to be counted, made whole. This is providence, providence. Not even a dentist to visit once a year like an aunt, squeezing my cheeks too tight. Without you, I got no one to say sorry to. Only this winter, pretending spring, Fooling few blooms, new haven next. The trees never do reach our train that clatters past, blurring cars, three parts primer, the rest rust, the color of ash, of ember. And then I'll read this one, it's called Late Blues. If I die, let me be buried standing. I never lied to anyone or down. Wouldn't want to start up now. Nice. So we've got some questions, man. These are some great questions, Kevin. Uh, question number one. Hey, here we go. You ready? Yeah, I'm always ready. All right. I'm, a very, I'm very excited about African-American poetry, 250 years of struggle and song. It is black poetry, black history, so much for me to love. Many consider poetry a genre for someone else. How do you propose getting more people interested in poetry so they too will appreciate the significance behind the upcoming collection? It's a great question. I mean, some of it I think is, uh, you know, I hope the collection helps shift people's thinking about poetry. So there's that, but I also think that, you know, hearing poetry aloud, um, you know, in a way, this is a kind of songbook, And there's one reason I mentioned song in the a subtitle of the book. It's a really a way, you know, I think especially black poetry has that oral tradition in it. And um, it's, it's that combination of song and uh, speech. Uh, it has that formal quality that you heard in, in uh, some of the other poetry I read uh, mm -hmm. by others but it also has this kind of song-like quality. And I guess I think, you know, helping people focus on the pleasure of a poem, sometimes people 
think of poems meant to be a task to be solved, but sometimes you just want to hear it aloud or, or read it and then, you know, sit with it a moment and then read it again. I mean, there is a quality of poetry gains and it deepens. There's poems I've read for, you know, years now, decades, and that change every time I read them and I notice something new. Um, and it's in that way, like a song, sometimes you hear a song once and you're like, oh, you know, I like it or I don't like it. But mm -hmm. then a song you really love that you hear again, suddenly it just deepens for you. And the good songs are layered and the good poems are like that, too. Um, so I think helping people understand that it both has an initial feeling, you know, and then it has a resonance. And there's a way in which we're not used to that always now. Um, you know, our devices are like immediate and then also mm -hmm. quickly disappear, effervescent in a way. And I think poetry fights that a lot, though. Also, I think online is a great place to explore poems. Uh, you can often hear uh, someone like Langston Hughes or even Claude McKay reading online. Um, and there is a project associated with it. And we're going to come back to Atlanta and talk about that Lift Every Voice. That's going to have a lot of those readings and things in it. So you can check out the Lift Every Voice website. Um, which helps think about these things uh, and that living tradition that uh, the, the viewer is asking about. Excellent. So that's a great segue for the next question. What do you take from your time in Atlanta that informs your current position and your place of residence? Well, I'm, I'm uh, talking to you from Harlem right now, uh, you know, the heart of the Harlem Renaissance. And um, there, I think I take that tradition and that, southernness and that you know in a way I did my own great migration back north um, my parents were uh, obviously from Louisiana both of them and um, you know we traveled a lot like I said in the beginning um, and so to me there's a way in which black culture has that kind of thing you carry with you and so we always ate southern food and you know I just called it food but we ate like you know uh <laughs> greens and okra I tease my mom I said we had okra every meal even breakfast you know I, I ate okra <laughs> so much and now I can't get good okra right now so um you know there's that tradition that returning to Georgia was really special for me uh to deepen my ties there and and connect with those food ways and drink ways and and, uh, you know, accents and, and uh, pleasures that I loved. Um, and I still carry that with me. Harlem, in a weird way, is this mix of, you know, international and, and Caribbean and uh, all over the world, but it's also Southern in some ways. And so th there's something pleasurable in that. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. For years, I had the Dudley Randall Black Poetry and Anthology as a tome. You mentioned the French anthology, but what other African-American poetry anthologies did you take inspiration from? It's a great question. So I do mention uh, Dudley Randall's and, and a number of other Black Arts 1960s, early 70s anthologies, which I think were really critical to the movement. And uh, some people have said uh, that, you know, the Black Power movement was an artistic movement with a, a you know, activist wing. You know, it really was. Mm -hmm. In many ways, Black Arts was the center of that movement. Um, but I look earlier, um, I talk a lot in the introduction about James Weldon Johnson's anthology from the early 20s, which he revised again, I think in 32, uh, to include a lot of the younger writers like Langston Hughes. And um, that's really an important anthology because it, it kind of names the tradition and it thinks about some of these um, vernaculars that were afoot. And he, he's able to kind of place in time the import of Black poetry. And that Negro poetry anthology is super important. Um, and that's probably the main one that I talk about. But, you know, there's the new Negro anthology in 25. There's so many anthologies in the Harlem Renaissance, as well as uh, Black arts. And I really want to sort of shout those out because uh, the viewer is absolutely right. I, I think Black anthologies have been a long, uh, important way that we've collected our voices and sent people out back to explore who they might discover. Um, a poet like Samuel Allen, who, who died, who people might not know, you know, there's his poems and please go then and find other of his poems. May Cowdery, who I mentioned, uh, who wrote in the thirties and published one book only, you know, I had to track that book down. You know, I, I don't have own a copy. Um, 
And uh, so somewhere like Schaumburg is really special because they had a lot of those books. The, only, the two places I were were the best places to be, starting at Emory, which has this great poetry stuff. But Schaumburg had just such deep Black poetry collections that I spent a lot of time just reading through and getting lost uh, in, in those anthologies and those older poets. Great. Thanks for that answer. Uh, next question. Are there any, are there poets or works that we will be surprised that are not included in this work? Second part of that question is, what was the most difficult decision you had to make in this anthology? I mean, I think the hardest decision was uh, not being able to put in uh, songs, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and so not putting in, uh, in that rich oral tradition, we talked about the blues themselves. Uh, was really hard. I mean, I was able to put in people like Gil Scott Heron and, um, you know, uh, Andy Razoff, who wrote What Did I Do to Be So Black and Blue in the, in the 20s. Um, but that's really it in terms of people who are songwriters and poets. Um, mm -hmm. And their stuff looks great on the page. And Razoff published just straight up poems and magazines, especially in newspapers, uh, in the Black press. And I think the other hard thing was really, you know, there's such a rich tradition, I started to realize, and you all probably know, of children's poetry uh, by Black authors. And not only, you know, there's a lot of poets who are in there as, I, I don't know the best word to put it, grown-up poets, you know, poets who are writing mm -hmm. mainly for adults, but um, they often wrote, including Langston Hughes or Marilyn Nelson, that, um, you know, uh, wrote for children too. And um, that I couldn't include that stuff just because of space, you know? And so gotcha. that was really hard to do. Um, but, you know, I hope people are surprised what's in it. And, you know, all anthologies are bound by actual uh, pages. Um, so having to make those tough choices was part of it. Indeed. Uh, next question, as we're coming close on our time here, did you include Lucy Terry Prince's Bar Fight? And if you did, why or why not? Great question. Uh, I did include Bar Fight, which uh, Bar's Fight, I think is the-, the Excuse name. me, yes, Bar's Fight. Yeah, um, and I did, uh, it's a really uh, interesting text. Uh, and as I'm sure the viewer knows, uh, it was, it's considered often the start of Black poetry. It was the first, um, it, well, it's a little complicated because it was an oral poem. It was passed down. And so the first mention of it is well after uh, Phyllis Wheatley, who starts my, mm -hmm. the volume. And I really decided to do that because the publishing record, uh, Wheatley is the first. Um, Jupiter Hammond, who's in the book, um, published poems and magazines before Wheatley. You know? So in a way, it's more than 250 years you know, <laughs> of poetry. But if we put Lucy Terry in there, uh, we see the ways that her poem was recorded uh, in print later uh, and had its sort of biggest impact later throughout uh, the 19th century. And so I included in there, of course, because it's such an early important work. It's also a troubling work in that it's about uh, a fight between settlers and native peoples. And so there is there is something about that that I talk about in the introduction that we can't get into here, but about this kind of politics mm -hmm. that it's kind of thinking about it, we might think of it differently than they did in the 19th and uh, 18th centuries. Um, that said, there's the poet Robin Costa Lewis, a wonderful poet who wrote a book uh, called The Sable, Voyage of the Sable Venus, which won the National Book Award. And Robin has a beautiful poem, uh, more recent than her book, uh, about Lucy Terry and the things Lucy Terry ordered uh, for her wedding day. And it's just a list. And, yeah. you know, like it just breaks your heart slash makes you realize that there's this long connection. And Robin, I think, especially amongst this great collection of poets, is able to think about how the smallest details tell us something about a person. And she's an archivist in that way and a historian in the, the biggest sense of, of making the past alive for us. And so Lucy Terry lives again in, in Robin Costa Lewis's work. All right, we got time for maybe two more questions. Uh, next question, and this is a fairly detailed one. Building on a previous question about which previous anthologies may have inspired or encouraged you, I specifically wonder about the poetry of the Negro, which had two very different editions. 
edited by Langston Hughes and Erna bon Bontemps. They also talked a lot about their decision-making process in their letters. Is your editing slash decision-making process recorded somewhere? I mean, uh, it is in an introduction and I'm sure the archive one day will reflect uh, the larger things. I love those anthologies, um, you know, uh, they were really important. Um, they too cast a wide net and um, everything from the font to the bio notes I love in those, those anthologies. Um, and so I certainly consulted those. Um, I don't think there's books that I didn't read. You know, I really was trying to cast a wide net and um, you know, those decision processes I do mention and talk about, you have to in some way, um, but a lot of them are, you know, permission questions and what space questions, questions that are real world questions that, you know, aren't resolved by uh, anything but doing the process. And so, um, you know, one day I think there'll be archives. My archives are at Emory, uh, you may know. And so um, one day this more recent stuff surely will join it there. Um, and so to me, that, that kind of, uh, process is always interesting, but also, you know, it, it is so uh, detailed that you can only say so much like in an introduction. All right. Last question of the evening. Okay. Where do you place Baraka's work in importance? Wow. These are really intense questions. I like them. They're, um, <laughs> they're thinking a lot about this tradition, which I think is, is a living one, you know, and obviously Baraka, who, uh, you know, I got to read with a few times and saw, and, uh, you know, I think I read with him at the Schomburg. That was my first time at the Schomburg years and years ago. Um, I think Baraka's incredibly important as a poet, uh, as perhaps uh, the viewer would too. Um, you know, I think Baraka's place has been pretty established and um, thought about, and, and, you know, there's a number of prominent poets from the 60s, uh, someone like Sister Sonia Sanchez, I think is so tremendous too, um, and uh, has a long relationship with the Schomburg Center, which is wonderful, uh, and including her being introduced to black literature at the Schomburg Center. And she tells some wonderful stories about that, um, which I'll say for another time. But I think that there is a rich poetry of that time. And I really was trying to capture people like Audre Lorde and, and uh, Michael S. Harper, other poets too, uh, who help us think about the milieu around Baraka. Uh, and so I hopefully did that. So last question, this is a for, for fun question and you may know this uh, viewer. Kevin, do you miss us as much as we miss you? The initials are RMM. <laughs> yes, I do miss miss <laughs> miss us. I ooh uh, R M M a call, so I'm going to call her uh, uh, after. But you know, it's wonderful to to be in touch and you know see Tony and the City of Decatur uh, label representing hard. I think in that picture from way back in the day, you have your City of Decatur shirt on, so you you represent strong. You know, actually, I had a work shirt on that day. I was not yet a city commissioner, so. <laughs> You know, so yeah, as we wrap up, was. Kevin, let's say it was. Let's say it was. What's next? What's next for you? Yeah. Well, I'm really, uh, I'm still writing poems. Uh, you know, I write prose too, and so between those two things, I'm staying pretty busy. I will have a, another book of poems out in a year or so, um, and uh, it, you know, it really is thinking about Louisiana again and and returning there. So. Uh, I don't know about you, but it's been such a strange time during quarantine to see how work changes and things we read. And this book uh, has poems over a number of years, but finishing it sort of during quarantine really took on a different cast. And a lot of the poems that were qu written quite before, even when Mac was little, now have a different feel to them. Well, I hope to finish it before we get out of quarantine. Kevin, on behalf of a grateful city and a grateful nation, Thank you so much for your time. And folks, if you enjoyed what you just saw, please consider donating to the AJC Decatur Book Festival presented by Emory University. We have loved our time together. Brother, as always, it's a pleasure. I can't wait to get up there and see y'all. I mean, yeah. whenever we get out of this lockdown, 
yeah. will bring you your glass and then we'll have <laughs> some right. pool. And we'll I'll, sit out and have some chicken that. or something. A lot of people or heard some barbecue. You say that. So you have What's to keep that? Your promise. A lot of people heard you say that. So you have to keep your promises. Hey man, I'm a politician. I keep my promises. <laughs> Thank you, folks. And Great that's the everyone. end of our time for tonight. Thank you all, and we'll see you next time. Good night. Good night.